This is Star Talk. Hello, this is Star Talk All Stars Edition. I'm your All Star host this evening. Carolyn Porco is my name. And I'm a planetary scientist and the leader of the imaging science team on the Cassini mission, which is, as we speak, in orbit around Saturn. My co-host today is Chuck Nice. Hey. Thank you, Chuck, for being here. Well, thank you. And my guest today is Chris McKay from uh, the Ames Research Center in the Bay Area. He's astrobiologist extraordinaire. Chris spends his time scouring the deserts of Earth from Antarctica to Siberia, Namibia, Sahara, trying to understand those places on the Earth that might be like Mars in their environment and wondering how life uh, can thrive there. Uh, he's been involved in conjuring what kind of human mission back to Mars uh, might be like. This is a mission that would be piloted by by humans. He's involved in that. And I've invited him here today because he is my cohort for the last 11 years in trying to get people to pay attention to what we have found with the Cassini mission at, on Enceladus, which is a small moon in the Saturn system, no bigger across than England, and why this small moon presents to us the most promising environment in the solar system to actually search for life, for evidence of prebiotic chemistry. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you. Yes. Um, so we've gathered your cosmic queries about Enceladus and astrobiology from various social media. That's right, Chuck. Haven't yes, we done that? that's exactly what we have done. And we have uh, questions uh, via Facebook and Twitter and uh, you name it, whether it's startalk.net, it doesn't make a difference. We take them. And uh, they all want to know about Enceladus and more. You know, astrobiology and more. You know, people see your name and, you know, some people just want to know about Cassini and some people want to know about Saturn. And so I know that we're kind of focused on Enceladus. But, uh, you know, when you when you say when when people who who follow us, when we say Carolyn Porco, they immediately think Saturn because Neil calls you Madam Saturn. I'm Madam Saturn. For the rest of my life, I'll be Madam Saturn. <laughs> it's all right. It could be. It could be worse. It could be a lot worse. It could be worse. <laughs> so uh, let's take our first. You know, we always like to have a Patreon for those of you who are interested in supporting us on Patreon. By doing so, uh, you get to do, uh, do cool things like uh, you get invited to parties that we might throw, or you can submit a question uh, for our cosmic queries, and we will make sure that we read it because you gave us money. <laughs> That's a basic yeah. transaction Isn't in it? life. Right? That's a basic right? life transaction. You gave us money, and now we're going to do something for you. <laughs> so um, this is from uh, uh, Luna McIntyre, who says, um, Do you think there are parallels that can be inferred by whatever is found with the Europa mission? Since the liquid oceans on both moons, I suppose both moons, she means Enceladus yes. and Europa, uh, uh, seems to be due to tidal heating. Um, so are there any, uh, first of all, is that the case? I mean, yes. are both moons, uh, 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 are there oceans created by tidal heating? And uh, are there any parallels that we can uh, draw or infer from um, the similarities between Europa and and Enceladus. There are a tremendous amount of parallels that we can draw. They are, in fact, both heated by this mechanism of tidal flexure, uh, which is why they um, have oceans within them, and both of them have oceans. Uh, and I would say it goes the other way, that we have been nearly a dozen years now exploring up close and personal Enceladus with the Cassini mission mm -hmm. and um, with a, an amazing suite of 12 investigations on the orbiter that have been brought to bear uh, over the course of those dozen years. And we know a tremendous amount about Enceladus, really far more knowledge about Enceladus at this point in time than we do about uh, Europa. But I'll turn this over to Chris because Chris also has a lot to say about this topic. So what do you have to say? Well, to me, the most interesting comparison between Enceladus and Europa would be comparing the type of life we might find in both of them. And imagine sometime in the future when we find life on Enceladus, we find life on Europa. Are they the same life? Do they represent a common origin? Or, do they, or did life start independently on both of these water worlds? 
or did life start on one and not the other? So I'm always focused on the biology questions, and a comparison between worlds is the most interesting possibility in terms of what kind of questions we can ask about biology and compare these two water worlds. And then, of course, we'd want to compare them to Earth as well. That's the biology on Europa, if there is any, and the biology on Enceladus, if there is any, compared to the biology we have here on Earth. That's the ultimate question for astrobiology. Yeah. And and let me let me just remind people that why why we've gone so goo goo gaga over Enceladus, and yes. that is because we found um, that it has a hundred and one tall geysers that are erupting from its south polar terrain, which is an area, if you were to scale Enceladus up to the size of the Earth, it would be like the latitude of Tierra del Fuego and everything south. Wow. Or if you were biased towards the northern hemisphere, it would be like uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, and everything north. Wow. So imagine having 101 enormous geysers erupting from the terrain that's that large, and once we found with Cassini these geysers, and we knew that the, with the particles that we see in our images were accompanied by vapor, right. and they formed this enormous plume that went ultimately tens of thousands of kilometers uh, into orbit around Saturn, we took Cassini and we went barreling through it. Right. We went barreling through it time and time and time again. And we've been able to collect material and measure the contents of the vapor, measure the contents of the particles, measure the characteristics of the particles, how big they are, how their size is distributed above the surface. And all this information has finally told us where we are right now. We know we have a global ocean under about 35 kilometers worth of ice. Okay. It's salty. It's, it's salty like the Earth's ocean wow. is salty. And it has... Uh, uh, organic material. So it's got all the formal requirements of what in the NASA world, the NASA universe, we call a habitable zone. And that ocean is accessible now. What we have to do is fly through it again with the proper instruments, right. better than we have on Cassini, to measure uh, uh, measure it at a, a, with a greater precision and ask, start asking really interesting astrobiological questions. Chris, what are some of the things we could do if we had a mission that went back to Enceladus with proper instrumentation? What, what kinds of questions do we really want to know? Well, I think you, you said it well, Carolyn. We already know it's habitable. We already know it has organic material. We already know it has liquid water. We know that that liquid water is habitable. So the, the, the follow-on questions really go right to the biology. Mm -hmm. Does this habitable environment, is it inhabited? Does it have life? And then the challenge is, how do we search for life? Well, we can search for life using molecules and tools that we develop for characterizing Earth life. But it'd be nice to also have a capability to detect life if it's not Earth life. So then the question becomes, how do we detect life that's similar to Earth, lives in water, made of carbon, but is not directly related to us, doesn't have our DNA? Uh, and I, I think the answer to that is to search for amino acids and search for their handedness and see if there is an enrichment of heavy, complex amino acids in the plume of Enceladus, and then to see if those amino acids all have the same handedness, which is a clear signature of biological selectivity. Hmm. So, so when you, um, you know, from an astrobiological standpoint, what would be, what would be uh, more desirable? Um, to analyze these things uh, uh, or uh, analyze these components flying through these plumes or capturing the water and bringing it back? Good question. That's a very, very good question. Um, there, is, uh, there are people out there, groups of people, uh, one group I know of that are looking at the possibility of a sample return. It's not a trivial thing to do because there's a lot of concern if you bring a sample back to Earth. You don't want to have an Andromeda strain scenario where wow. you contaminate yes. the Earth. So, you know, that has to be done carefully. But Those Earthlings were really something special until they bought back that old Enceladus <laughs> water. Hmm? Really? That was the beginning of the end. You know, the instruments that we have on Earth are far more sophisticated than the ones that we could carry on a spacecraft. So. Right. Uh, so Chris, in fact, has been a big um, proponent of a sample return mission. Yeah. But, but as Carolyn points out, 
one has to be extremely careful in bringing back a sample from an environment that we think could have life in it. And that environment is very similar to Earth's oceans. Uh, we've never done that before. We've brought back samples before, but we've never brought back a sample from a habitable environment. So this is a, a new, new challenge, and we have to proceed extremely carefully with it. So I think, realistically, the next missions to Enceladus will not be sample return. They will investigate the plume in situ, following up on Cassini, but they will be designed to search for life, unlike Cassini. Cassini did a fabulous job. It was a wonderful uh, uh, and unexpected find, and its ability to investigate it surprised all of us. Uh, and what it told us also surprised all of us. So now we're back with a mission that's based on what we know and search for life in the plume. And then, meanwhile, think about how we bring a sample back safely, because ultimately we have to do that. Yeah, I wanted, can I just make a plug for Cassini? Because as Chris said, the instruments on Cassini that were really, I mean, the cameras, you know, can take a picture of anything. But the instruments that told us about the chemistry mm -hmm. were not designed to investigate a plume of material that was as tenuous as that which is coming off the south pole of Enceladus. They were designed to um, measure the atmosphere of Titan, for example, okay. uh, which is much more hefty. So um, it just, it was a beautiful demonstration of how important it is to first of all be in orbit and kind of take up residence in a planetary system so you have the leisure of discovering something and then going back to investigate it again and again and making changes in your approach. Right. Um, and that's what we did with Cassini. But I want to add just one more thing about Enceladus, which fascinates me. 92, 94% of the stuff that's being erupted from the South Pole of Enceladus, the particles, not the vapor, but the particles, comes back down to the surface. Right. It snows back down to the surface. So if there are microbes in the ocean of Enceladus that are being, sh you know, shot right. out, they are, it's snowing microbes at the South Pole of Enceladus. So I think another thing we want to do is we want to go sample those particles and see if there are microbes in it. That's what I get really excited about. That's so, pretty cool. That I, it doesn't get any cooler than that. Yeah, that is, I mean, yeah <laughs> okay. that's, that's like, that's a, uh, that's a holy grail. That's pretty fun. Now, yeah. and what do you do when you do that? Is that, is that putting instrumentation down on the surface? Well, this is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've all been discussing this. We're discussing how you might uh, actually do this. And it just occurred to me recently, you don't need to land on the surface. Okay. All you need to do is really get into orbit around Enceladus. And the speed with which you pick up these particles would be gentle enough that you would not destroy part of, uh, microbes that were in the ice particles. And that's what we want. We'd love to be able to take a look at them. Now, whether or not we have the instrumentation now to do it is a question. Maybe, Chris, do you know something about this? The... Uh, the capabilities of microscopic imagers to do this sort of thing? As you point out, we don't have a heritage in planetary missions of searching for life. We haven't done that since Viking, 1976. But meanwhile, NASA and other organizations have been developing technologies for studying life on Earth. Uh, there's been satellites in Earth orbit that have looked at biology. There's technologies on the space station. And these life sciences technologies can be applied to the search for life and be made suitable for planetary missions. Life uh, sciences like technology? Yeah, what that's is correct. what do you what do you mean by life sciences tech that sounds oddly like uh, like a life coach. <laughs> no, 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 not not that. What I mean is not lifestyle, not a lifestyle. Not, not a lifestyle. Coach. Like what are what is the life sciences? Go ahead. Well we can we can think of two different jobs that we might do in space. One is take life from Earth right. and study it in space. That's called life sciences. The okay. other is search for life on other worlds, life detection. They're both centered on life, but in one case, you're taking life with you and studying it. In the other case, you're going somewhere and seeing if there's life there. But for example, a, a fluorescent microscope would be handy in both cases. Well, there's not been the development of such a microscope for planetary, but there has been for life sciences. People have taken these kind of instrumentation into orbit to study organisms that they've carried with them to investigate the response of these organisms to the space environment. Uh -huh. We can take that technology and repurpose it to searching for life 
in the plume of himself. Oh God, oh, that's, that's so great. it's so exciting. I can barely stand it. <laughs> that 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 is that's, really it's it's like there. It's waiting for us to go back. Super cool. Super cool. Yeah. Okay, um, let's go on to uh, another question. We have a little bit of time left in our segment, so uh, let's let's grab another question from uh, Nicole coming to us from Twitter at uh, Cape Girl is her name. And she's uh, talking with respect to astrobiology. Uh, what role, if any, would the study of planetary atmospheres and remote sensing have on the search for extraterrestrial life? So is there anything that we can glean just from looking at a planet that we know does not have life on it and look at the planet's atmosphere? And uh, I'll go one step further and say even the planet's landscape from, um, uh, from the standpoint of astrobiology and find out about life uh, or, or, the, uh, or extraterrestrial life in, on that planet. Um, okay, so I think Chris, this is one for you. Did you, did you get that? Yep, I got okay. it. And this is a, a really good question. It's a really good question. And it has implications right now on searching for life uh, on other worlds, on other stars, exoplanets, and also searching for life on Titan, which is a world that does have an atmosphere, mm -hmm. and we can characterize. And the thought is that planet, that life does affect the planet uh, and its atmosphere. Here, you had on Earth, the oxygen in our atmosphere is clearly produced by biology. If we see oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, I would take that as pretty compelling evidence that there is life on that planet Ooh. making that oxygen. We wow. can apply that same logic. We can't apply that logic to Enceladus. It doesn't have an atmosphere, nor does Europa. But Titan does. It's a very different atmosphere than Earth's, would have very different life. But we can take the same logic. If there was life on Titan, how would it change the atmosphere? And the conclusion seems to be it would be depleting hydrogen. So we imagine a mission that goes to Titan and searches for a depletion of hydrogen. And he uses that as a biosignature the same way that the presence of oxygen in an atmosphere is used as a biosignature. Okay, as Chris, your questioner, Chris, we have sorry. to, we have okay, to, ahead, I'm sorry. sorry, we have to take a short break now. We'll come back to uh, what you're saying because it's really exciting and uh, we'll take more of the cosmic queries from our audience when Star Talk returns. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio, All Stars Edition. I'm your All Star host, Carolyn Porco, and joining me in the studio is Chuck Nice. Yes. Thank you for being here. Uh, such a pleasure. And, you're, you're a delight, Carolyn. I mean that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and our special guest is Chris McKay, planetary scientist and astrobiologist extraordinaire at NASA. And he was in the middle of giving us an argument yeah. about what you might uh, look at. Uh, on a planet or a moon that had an atmosphere. atmosphere and how that would determine life. And uh, you were talking about what, uh, if you were to look at an atmosphere and see oxygen, you would know or you would be able to strongly, in indicate. strongly indicate that, hey, something created that, something biological created that. So can you go on from there? Well, the, the point was uh, this is a very powerful technique because it can be done remotely. And the questioner indicated that, and this is true. This is the only way we could detect life currently around planets, around other stars. Um, gotcha. th there's some question. Now, I would just be maybe the devil's advocate here and say that you could never really know to 100% confidence that that kind of a biosignature would give you, uh, would mean life, but it would be a strong indicator, I think. That's right. It, yeah. it would certainly be very exciting to be an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star and find high level of oxygen in the atmosphere of that planet. Yeah. Uh, technically, there's other ways, but it would be a strong indication of life. Yeah, I know, I know people in that community who think that um, the only way you'd really know if we had life would be the interception of a signal from an extraterrestrial intelligence. That's like the only thing that would really give you 100% confidence. But, but it, would be, it would be a red letter day if we found an exoplanet with... Uh, oh, that's fantastic. That's, that's good. Well, Nicole, thank you for such a very well thought out question. Let us move on uh, and ask a question from Doug Dumphy, who wants to know, 
What's the next likely mission to Enceladus? And what do you hope it is capable to do beyond Cassini? Hashtag CQ Enceladus, which is our hashtag. I don't know why I read that. <laughs> well, um, you're just you're just being. I'm just being just, thorough. You're being yes. thorough, right? You're being a little too thorough. I think we just said that, but we can say it again. Um, yes, we did. We did kind of get into that, uh, but go ahead. I was just going to say, Cassini has done a bang-up job uh, unexpectedly because, as one of us, Chris, said, I think we didn't really, we suspected Enceladus might have geysers, but we didn't expect that it would, uh, they would be, um, they would look the way they do and be as vigorous a phenomenon as it has been. It's just been an explorer's dream come true. And so what we want to do next is go back with instrumentation that is far better than that which was carried by Cassini, uh, look at the chemical constituents to a finer level of uh, detail and look at abundances of compounds, look at, as Chris mentioned, the handedness of compounds, because you know, earthly life uh, prefers a particular type of molecule to another. Mm -hmm. And if we see that same kind of signature in a uh, on, on another planet that might also indicate a process like life that has singled that uh, particular type of molecule out. So those are the kinds of things we would look for. And like I said, one of my favorites is actually to grab and look at and image microbes. So um, that's the kind of things that we're talking about going back to Enceladus. Nice. But uh, the, 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 the key is we are going back. Is that the case? Oh, no, nothing. What? What do you no, mean? No, well, Why would you say that? Well, there's a bunch of us that are really pressing for it, and we have the opportunity. There's We now can submit to NASA uh, what are called New Frontiers proposals. So okay. this is proposals for a, a, like a big chunk of money, something like $850 million. Uh, but that doesn't mean we'll get selected. There are people who want to go to Venus, people who want to go return a sample from a comet. There's lots of so now Let me ask you this. I mean, this is, this is just part of our conversation. And I, I think it's terrible that we have to kind of... Um, Make choices. Make choices like this. These Sophie's choices where, you know, it's like, well, should we go to Venus or should we go to Mars or should we go back to and so it's like we should be doing all of this, to be honest. I mean, wow. let's let's be let's be very square. We should be doing all of this. Um, so how do you prioritize um, which missions should take place and when? Uh, is there a particular protocol that should be in place to determine uh, maybe this mission is important, uh, but it's more important if we go now. Maybe this mission is important, but it really won't be important until, you know, 2030. So how do you go about making the case for, you know, uh, getting these limited funds, which shouldn't be limited as far as I'm concerned? Well, they are limited. And Chris, I'll let you deal with this. You're the guy who works at NASA. <laughs> sure, sure. But I, I'll tell you my way of prioritizing these. Because I have to prioritize my time also. What do I work on? Uh, all the planets are interesting. I prioritize it based on what's going to tell us the most about biology now. And I think the clear winner is Enceladus. So I would answer, are we going to Enceladus? Yes, because it's clearly the place where we can learn the most about possibility of life right now. Uh, other worlds are interesting too. But Enceladus is ready for investigation. Uh, there's samples there. As Carolyn said, it's a habitable environment. Samples coming out into space. It's the low hanging fruit. It's what we ought to do first, in my opinion. Yeah, it's not clear. It's, it's not clear it's going to happen. But uh, Chris and I, that's why we're cohorts in this together. Nice. We're trying to keep Enceladus up front and center in the minds of people because uh, it it is like he said. It's it. We're ready. We're ready now. We know enough to go back and do the job right. Good stuff. Let's move on and take another uh, question. Um, this one a little bit more broad from uh, Kabir uh, Mal Malhotra. I'm, I'm terrible. Carolyn, you will know the more you do this. Uh, people like to, and Chris, you will know because I'm sure you will return as a guest. Uh, people send me their names and. Uh, you have no idea how to pronounce it. And them. I butcher their names like you can't believe. And I think that they're doing it on purpose now. <laughs> I I, th I really do. I think people are just sending me made up names just to, to, just to, just to see, see me squirm <laughs> and struggle, and <laughs> because uh, but well, anyway, at least they're listening. This is true. Okay, exactly. So this is. I hope I'm saying 
Kabir Malhotra. Malhotra. Okay. Assuming the universe is infinite. That's a big assumption right there. I mean, is the universe infinite? Because I really don't think it is. But anyway, let's not, that's, this is not, I'm not answering these questions. You are. But, um, <laughs> how long will it take uh, to produce an exact copy of Earth? I don't think he means exact copy of Earth, but an Earth-like planet. Just, you know, basically our Earth. So an exact copy is ridiculous because... You right. know, that's ridiculous to say an exact copy of Earth. You, that's just never going to happen. I, and by the way, the Earth is changing all the time. So what would that exact copy be? Right. You know, because yes, the good, Earth that we point. live on today is not the Earth that was here four million years ago. That's right. So it's a completely different planet now. So but how long would it take to produce an Earth planet? Well, I would, I'm going to turn this around because okay. it's, that's very difficult to answer. So I'm going to turn it around to something that's possible to answer. <laughs> um, I the, like the, the way you work. The Kepler results of how many exoplanets there are and what characteristics they are. This is Kepler with follow-on Earth-based observations from telescopes like Keck um, have indicated something like 25%, I hope I get this right, 25% of the planetary candidates uh, that they find in the habitable zone of their star are Earth-sized, okay? Oh, okay? I think that's right. And then some fraction of those would be Earth-like, and you could call it, you know, Earth twin, Earth's uh, twin. Oh, right. Um, and I don't know, someone took a reasonable guess, maybe let's say 20%. I, you know, it's common. Nothing on our planet is is unusual. That's, right. that's what we've been able to glean about the universe is, you know, what we have here is probably lots of other places. Right. So... 25% of the planetary candidates in their habitable zone are like Earth-sized. Let's say 20% of those are Earth-like, which means like the Earth, mm -hmm. okay, the copy. And, and when you go through all the numbers, the last time I heard this, which was probably six months or a year ago, the number came out to something like 5 billion, 4 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. Oh, my. That's At, right just now, here, right, right now. now. Right, Chris? Do I got that right? The, the, the gist of the argument is certainly correct. There wow. are going to be in our own galaxy uh, a lot of Earth-like planets. We wow. just got to look. Uh, we know that there's lots of planets out there, and some of them are going to be like Earth. We don't need an infinite universe. Our own ga galaxy, in fact, our own stellar neighborhood probably has lots and lots and lots of Earth-like planets arbitrarily closely similar to Earth. The more we want to look, the That's more right. we can find ones that are as close to Earth as we want it to be. Really, we, we might have a lot of community work ahead of us. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty unnerving when you think about it because uh, now— Unnerving, okay. it's, it's, it's it, like— it's, it's just— in, It's incredibly it's incredible. exciting. It is exciting. exciting. When I say unnerving, I mean in a, in, 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 in a good in, sense. In a good sense. It is really that exciting that, that it's unnerving. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's shocking is what right. it is. It's shocking. Um, so now let me ask the both of you this. Um, uh, with that in mind, um, does it necessarily increase the likelihood of there being intelligent life on one of those planets since we pretty much developed on this planet? Uh, does it increase the likelihood or does it, does it not? I mean, are those two things related in any way scientifically or, I mean, you know. Well, well look, we have, we have, um, a, a statistic of one, right. you know, on an earth-like planet, one Civilization has developed to the point where we call ourselves intelligent and we are capable of communicating across space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it happened once, uh, it's likely to happen again. How, how likely is it? I don't know. I guess that's a guess. But I, I'm an optimist. I think that probably it's, it's happened many times. Chris, do you want to take a guess? What do you think? You're an optimist, yeah, I know. I, I I, I am as well, and I, I think it's useful to divide the question into two steps. One is the distribution of life, and then secondly, the distribution of intelligent life. Certainly, we think that life should be widespread. Uh, whether some of those life forms develop intelligence is a more deeper question, but I tend to be an optimist too. So I think we're going to find the universe is full of life, and that many, but not all, of those life-bearing planets have developed intelligence. Yeah. Gotcha. That doesn't mean that they're like on their way to get us right now. It's the distances are, I mean, are prohibitive. Yeah. You know, when you say 
a star is 12,000 light years away. That We're talking the, the time it takes light. Right. The fastest thing we have to get here. It would take us far, far longer than that. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 realistically, these the, life could exist there, but our being able to get to that life is very unlikely. Well, um, eventually, I suppose we could put put some robotic spacecraft on a course for oh, some well, gotcha, star right. and maybe. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Robot, I mean, that's so, so that brings me to another question from both of you, okay, especially you, Chris, being an astrobiologist. Is it more important to have a first contact uh, from one of us making contact with intelligent life or from an emissary that we have created, uh, i.e. a robot or uh, android or, you know, some representation of human life, uh, whether it's a computer or what have you. Uh, and, you know, of course, that probably will make more sense because we can send that thing out and just let it go. We don't have to feed it. We don't have to worry about it dying. And it's not going to bitch and complain like I'm lonely and I miss my family. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you, 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 if yeah. So, I mean, we, 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 is, is, that, is that most likely how we're going to make our first contact? Uh, you know, we might have made a first contact already. Ooh. You know, I mean, we have our, uh, our signals uh, sent out. Uh, what did Dan Wertheimer just say? He said uh, 70 years ago. Right. Seven, something like that. Um, but, you know, so, so we won't know. That's the thing about this whole thing. This, the distances are so huge. We won't know. <laughs> if we've made a contact with another civilization until we hear back from them. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. So we have uh, just limited time. So um, we're going to wrap this up for this segment. Uh, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to entertain more of our listeners' cosmic queries um, when Star Talk returns. Hello again, and welcome back to Star Talk Radio, All Stars Edition. I am your All Star host, Carolyn Porco, and joining me in the studio is my my fabulous, wonderful, dynamic co-host, Chuck Nice. Hey. Thank you. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. For and a moment, I started to look around to see who, who, else? who else was here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we have as our special guest, we have Chris McKay, who's an astrobiologist from NASA Ames Research Center in the Bay Area. We've been talking about the search for life in the solar system. There isn't a topic that's more exciting than that. And um, we're going to now discuss what kind of life we might find on a place like Enceladus and how might it be different than the life we have here on Earth. This is a really uh, tantalizing question because I think most people would agree it would really be far more interesting to find life that was entirely different from the life we have here, biochemically, metabolically, all those things, because then we'd have a point of comparison that we could make and that would give us insights into um, how life developed one way on one planet and one way on the other. So, Chris, why don't you weigh in on this for us, because I'm sure this is something that you've thought quite a lot of. Sure. Normally, when we talk about different life, we're thinking something exotic, like maybe silicon-based life or something. And that's not what we're going to find on Enceladus. Enceladus is a world with water and carbon. Life there will be based on carbon, just like us. But it might still be profoundly different. How that carbon and water arranges to form biochemistry could be very different on Enceladus. So, for example, DNA, which we use to store information may not be the same molecule used on Enceladus to store information. The proteins on Enceladus may be made out of amino acids, just like the proteins on Earth, but they may be made out of different amino acids. Or the chirality, the handedness of those amino acids might be opposite. So there's many ways that life on Enceladus could be very, very different than life on Earth, and it would be very interesting to do that comparison. Um, now, for us to do that... I'm guessing that um, that's going to be pretty hard to do with the kind of stuff we're talking about that might be done on the very next mission to Enceladus. I'm going to guess that in order to do that, we really got to bring samples back to Earth. Do you agree with that? To well, really, not necessarily. To, I think. A, go ahead. 
I think we could go a long way with instruments that we send there. If, for example, we search for amino acids and we find that the plume of Enceladus has amino acids, complex ones, and they're all, let's say, right-handed, the opposite of Earth life, then we've learned an enormous amount about life on Enceladus and we've determined that there's life there and it's a separate life from Earth life. Uh -huh. um, okay, so you're talking about the chirality or handedness, but what about the way its proteins are structured or the way the, you know, the amino acids go together? That's really higher order stuff. That's hard to do without bringing a sample back. Don't you agree? Sure. We won't answer all of our questions. We won't answer all of our questions, but we'll answer. <laughs> Sounds like you've got some life yeah. form there yeah. crawling around. Yeah. <laughs> We, <laughs> we won't answer who wants to go. Oh, <laughs> we, won't okay. answer, we won't answer all of our questions. Uh, and more complex questions will, will require more complex instrumentation. But we will be able to answer some questions. And if there is life there, we have a good chance of determining that it's there and determining that it's alien from Earth life. So we'll, <clears throat> we could, in principle, go pretty far down a logic tree. Now, eventually, yes, we do want to bring a sample back to Earth. Eventually, the level of sophistication we'd like to apply to investigating a different type of life is the state of the art. And to do that, you need to bring the sample back. But we can make a lot of progress on the next mission if we send the right instance. Okay, so let me, let me, we, you know, this is our last segment, and I just wanted to open it up even more if I could, Chuck. Go ahead, right? please, please. In the Saturn system, there's another tantalizing place, uh, which is Titan. Titan is considered kind of, believe it or not, we used to think of Venus as uh, the sister planet to Earth, but Titan is even more like Earth mm -hmm. in many respects than, uh, than Venus is. It has uh, landforms that are like we have here on Earth because it's got a substance in its atmosphere, methane, which acts like water does right. here on Earth, and it rains out of the sky, it can form clouds. Uh, it can carve channels and gullies and, and so on. It can pond on the surface. And in fact, it's doing that. In the polar regions of Titan, we have found seas of liquid methane. Wow. Laced with ethane. So, I mean, think of, you know, um, Lake Michigan brimming with paint thinner or something like that. Uh, you know, that's not too far off in the future. If, <laughs> yeah, if we keep going the way we're going right now. <laughs> so, so, you know, now I'm not a fan of thinking that we have life in the seas of um, Titan because, or at least, excuse me, I should say that we have a chance of really recognizing it because it would be so different than we have here on Earth because yeah. we know about earthly life. But I know Chris is a big fan of this idea, so I wanted to give Chris the opportunity to elaborate on the possibility that we could have life in Titan seas, given that the temperature there is so cold and the kinetics are going to be so slow and so on, and then how we might go about even recognizing uh, life in the Titan seas. Well, that's a, a really good question. And it roots to what do we think life needs? It's clear that life needs a liquid. On Earth, that liquid is water. The only other liquid that's widespread in the solar system is the liquid methane and ethane on Titan. So could life use that liquid? Now, it's very different than water. But that doesn't mean that a different type of life couldn't use it. But it would be so different, we wouldn't really know how to recognize it. And that's where we would on um, the effect that life has on its atmosphere. As we talked about earlier, if there's life on Titan, it might be consuming hydrogen. And we might be able to detect that atmospheric effect more readily than we could actually detect the life form because we don't even know what kind of molecules to search for. Right. It certainly <clears throat> doesn't use amino acids. Yeah, right. It doesn't use amino acids. So it's, it's going to be significantly different. It's just a challenge in the space program. It's a challenge to, uh, you know, like I said, this is where the rubber meets the road. You have yeah. to design an experiment. You have to know what you're going to measure. Uh, and when you're looking at, at an environment that's alien to the Earth and life that may not even be constructed like the Earth, that is no common biochemicals, it becomes very challenging. Yes. That was fascinating. That was great stuff. Great stuff. I'm, I mean, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still... Uh, fascinated by just the fact of life living in a methane ocean. 
that that alone is kind of mind-boggling. Which... Yeah, well, you know, you know, they say was it Rudyard Kipling that said travel is mind-expanding? Well, you know, planetary exploration <laughs> is mind-blowing. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's take a question. Pardon me. <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry. <clears throat> Drew Davenport, and Drew Davenport is writing from Wilmot, Illinois. Here on planet Earth. He actually put it that way. Oh, that's good. We want him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Have you ever found anything that you couldn't identify or thought was really strange during a spectral analysis? This is uh, uh, for both of you, actually, because I'm sure that spectral analysis is is part of uh, both your missions. Oh, major, major. Um, Well, is there anything that comes back where you're just like, my, that's that's odd. Well, strange. Um, I, I'm not a spectral analyzer myself, but I remember in the early days of the Cassini mission when we were looking at the results of one of the spectrometers, uh, on board Cassini that had scooped up material in the plume, Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some signatures that they couldn't make sense of. And I think at first, in fact, they made a tentative identification, which did not turn out to be correct. And it turned out to be salt. (laughs) <laughs> they had they had not thought that there would be salt. Uh, and when they went back and said, okay, maybe this is salt, and they went back and did the match, it was a great match. So that's my little anecdote. Chris, you must have one. I can't think, think of something offhand, but along the lines, uh, I remember when we were first going to Titan, we thought it had a global ocean. When we got there, it didn't. Uh, so that we were often surprised. I think we have to keep that in mind. We, we, our guesses of what's out there are often wrong. Right. The only way to know is to go look. You know, this brings up something that I love to just remind people of. In, in being explorers like we are, you know, we're yes. kind of our, if not our bodies, our minds and our emotions are on these robotic spacecraft that we send across the solar system. And, you know, they find things that are, you know, we say, oh, my God, that's so surprising. We felt that way about the Enceladus plume. We felt that way about the distribution of the hydrocarbons on Titan. Uh, We all felt that way about Pluto when New Horizons got to Pluto. Oh, my goodness, look at this. These regions where you have ice convection and these polygonal features, it's not so much that it's a failure of knowledge. It's a failure of imagination. Mm. We understand physics pretty well and chemistry. We understand what happens at various uh, regimes, physical regimes. But it's just that we don't spend an infinite amount of time imagining all the various permutations we might find there. And when we get there, we end up being surprised. Like take the Enceladus geysers. We knew post-Voyager, this was after the Voyager mission, a couple of years later, uh, a paper was written about the possibility that we could have water geysers on Enceladus. Right. All right. It was suggested that these geysers, they might not have been called geysers, but they would be producing particles that would go into orbit around Saturn to produce the E-ring in which Enceladus is centrally embedded. So that was the connection. So we had... Geysers on the brain when we went to back to Enceladus with Cassini, and we even the imaging team planned observations to look for them. And the first image that we have of a plume coming off Enceladus has the word plume in the title of the observation. It was deliberately planned to search for plumes. Right. So we knew what we possibly might find, but nobody took the time to imagine, well, okay, so we have geysers coming off Enceladus. The gravity on Enceladus is only one hundredth of the gravity here on the Earth. So these things are going to be enormous. No one thought that. Right. So we get the, there and we see this incredible spectacle. Uh, and it just it it just reminded me of this, that, you know, we, we always fail to imagine what we might find. So, um, it, and it's what it makes it so thrilling, you know, just seeing something for the first time. It's just... Uh, it's mind blowing. That's pretty cool. Of course, it's cool. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. All right, let's uh, actually Theron, actually, no, actually Theron, and uh, coming to us on Twitter at Astro Theron, uh, not to be confused with Charlize He's Theron. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a fan of Charlize. Uh, says, uh, ask this. I really don't understand this question at all. So you guys don't have to help me. Given similar environmental challenges 
i.e. liquids behave the same, is it possible for exobiology to produce a species similar to us? Um, I, 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 so we have only about a minute. Oh, yeah, uh, have, so you're saying given similar biology? Is that the uh, similar chemistry? Yeah, similar environmental, uh, yes. Should we expect something similar to us? Yes. In other words, is, is, is that are, are we more likely to find something similar to us given the similar situations or uh, environmental situations or, uh, you know... I think or should I, we be using our imagination to look for what you just said? Uh, okay, well, uh -huh. so using your imagination for every permutation would take quite a bit of time. I think this is a question that really devolves to this. What in the evolution of life, what role was played by basic physics and chemical laws, and what was played by serendipity? What was, you know, a meteor hit the earth and destroyed the first experiment, just wiped out all life that was just getting started, right. uh, and then um, giving something else the opportunity to evolve. Like, you know, the dinosaurs being wiped out open up the, the way for us. So thank we you. only have seven, six seconds. Dying. We're going to have to wind down now. Chris and Chuck, thank you for helping us out today. Oh, it's a pleasure. You've been listening to Star Talk Radio All Stars Edition. I've been your All Star host, Carolyn Porco. Until next time. This is Star Talk.